Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Building Materials Marketing Unboxed. This is Season 2, Episode 7, and the title of today's show is How Building Product Manufacturers Can Support Contractors in Navigating Construction Manument. Management, excuse me, construction management. And today we have Christopher Randall. He is the author and instructor of construction management, estimating and skilled trade topics for LinkedIn learning. So I'm really excited to talk with him. I was just talking with him before the show. This is going to be a great show. So uh, let's learn a little bit more about Chris. He is an avid professional football fan and of course we got to find out what team he cheers for the most chris is also a foodie as well as a cook and um he and i agree on what is the best food to cook that's for sure chris loves to travel especially going to the beach as i mentioned he is the author and instructor of construction management as well as estimating and skill trade topics for linkedin learning he's also the chief estimator at ridley electric LLC. Please welcome to the show. Please welcome to Building Materials Marketing Unboxed, Christopher Randall. Welcome, Chris. How are you today? Hi. Good. <laughs> I'm doing good. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Okay. Favorite thing to cook. Let's let everyone know. We talked about it before. <laughs> Let's let everyone know. What do you like to cook, well, my friend? I love to cook Italian food. Um, I love to cook everything, actually. I love to eat everything, but Italian food, obviously, is, is just so good. And there's, there's so much diversity to it, and it's, you know, it's always better with the freshest ingredients. So it, Italian is, is definitely good. Now, I, I, as I also mentioned to you, um, I'm always on the eternal quest for the perfect steak, so I like to cook both of those things. Uh, man, you and I are cut from the same cloth. As I mentioned, now, I'm not Italian, but I married very well. My wife is Italian, so, of course, I love the Italian food. And, of course, who could go wrong with a good steak, especially now that we've hit summertime? Although I've been known to cook a steak in the middle of winter on the grill. How about you? Same. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I live in upstate New York where we get 100 inches of snow a year, and uh, that never stops me from... Uh, making a big steak and having a big glass of red wine and watching the snow come down. Uh, it's just absolutely one of our favorites. My wife and I both love steak. So, uh, yep, that's one of my favorite things to do is to cook and to eat. There you go. So when you're sitting down and in, uh, in the middle of winter, who you, who's on TV? Who's watching? Who are you watching uh, professional football wise? All right, we'll go there. Um, <laughs> this is, you either love me or hate me, but I'm a huge New England Patriots fan. I have been since the 80s, since I was in middle school. Um, I've had many tough years and many great years. So, uh, yeah, I've been myself and my family. We love the Patriots. We'll, we watch uh, watch the games every Sunday. Uh, have everyone around at the house. It's kind of our church. Um, that's what we do on Sundays. That's kind of your church. I think that's a great way to put it. Uh, it's a great way to bring together the family. I, of course, am in Pittsburgh. I have to bleed black and gold. Uh, that's where that's where my family uh, enjoys. But uh, I certainly agree with you. I know where I know where my family's going to be on a Sunday. So it's a great way to bring people together. And I do like the fact that you've been since middle school. You're not one of those bandwagoners. So uh... <laughs> no, no, no. I went through a lot of tough years being a. Uh... Uh, a Patriots fan that with a team that lost m way more games uh, than it won. So yeah, so my time has come, and so it, it, it's been great. We love football, and I combine my cooking with that and our our, our joy of entertaining and eating, and it's just uh, it's a great it's a great part of our life. Living your best life. That's what it sounds like to me, Chris. So, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan. doing your best. That's great. So let's let's jump right into it. I gave you a list of questions, and uh, so I'm going to start with the first one. So, what does it mean to you for a manufacturer to provide top level customer support? Uh, well, you know, remember I'm a contractor. So, what do I what am I looking for from manufacturers yes. for top level support? Yep. Uh, Keep in mind, I'm so as an electrical contractor, where we I work in the MEP field, where there's a lot more what I call engineered products, things that were you know not sand or asphalt or dirt or gravel, but it, we have commodity con products like conduit and wire, and then a lot of engineered uh, products such as panel boards and lighting and um, and, and circuit breakers, anything that, that that makes moves or makes noise. But as far as that's concerned, uh, the best support that I can get from my manufacturers and manufacturers reps is, uh, you know, a constant communication, 
um, representing good products that have good reputation and just really understanding what us as, as the contractors go through and what we're up against as, as a contractor, as an installer and trying to support us in those regards, you know, whether it's delivery times or quality of product, or, you know, maybe there's some startup or some support that's needed for a particular type of product or product data. I mean, there's just so much that goes into getting the materials from the manufacturer to into the hands of the end user, um, really having a good understanding of that. Uh, and it all starts with communication, just good communication. It doesn't, you don't have to be extremely intelligent if you, as long as you're able to talk and continue talking and be a little humble and ask the right questions and, and you're willing to learn what your contractor is up against, that makes all the difference in the world. Oh, that's, I want to go back to something that you just said. That's great. I, that's a great way to start things off. Something that you just said about the communication. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is obviously uh, through the pandemic, uh, you know, order lead times, delivery delays, things like that. Um, how have you seen manufacturers? Are they doing a pretty good job in your estimation, making that communication happen? Uh, yes and no. Uh for the most part, they are, but you have to understand most contractors uh, engage in projects that are very, very long durations. So the suppliers don't even know what the actual install dates usually are. Um, recently, because of all of the delays and back orders on construction materials, I am getting more and more warnings that prices may go up and there are long lead times, uh, but they don't necessarily always tell me oh, these, this batch of lights will take so many weeks or these panels will take so much week or this conduit will take so long, but we're, we're asking. I think it's really incumbent upon the, the, the estimator and the project manager to ask those questions and, to, and to, to talk more about it, but it is tough. I sympathize with the manufacturers because you may quote a project for us in April of one year and we're not expecting to take delivery until April of the next year. So uh, again, it's just good communication. Hey, here's a quote. Uh, at the very least, the manufacturer should include in their quotation or pricing structure that um, mat material price and availability is subject to change. And here's an estimated amount of duration that it would take to create or deliver the product. So uh, just in that one statement right there, what, how are you handling that when you're estimating job costs and trying to prepare bids and things? How is this, uh, the, the rising costs and the variable construction uh, material price changes? I mean, how do you account for that? What are you doing to, you know, really uh, when it comes to preparing job costs and preparing bids? Well, there's, there's a few different ways. Um, it's, it's really not quite as difficult as you may think because for one, all the contractors are really in the same boat when it comes to material. Unless you make your own material, we're all buying from really a lot of the same manufacturers, uh, vendors, manufacturers, reps. So we, you have to have an eye on your pricing. You could use pricing services. You can, you can get good written pricing uh, sheets or quotations or whatever, what have you. Uh, and, but when you use an estimating software or when you're writing a price quotation to an owner, um, you need to just think about the escalation that may happen. And, and you can do that. You can consider it and include it in your price, or you can exclude pricing escalation in your price, but note in your proposal, if it's a written proposal and not just a low bid, that, uh, that your pricing is based on a particular price point for a particular commodity whether it is steel or copper or whatever media that you're using, it could be asphalt or concrete and put in a pricing escalation clause. Um, a good estimator should have a little bit of a speculative nature though. And they should say, Hey, listen, we've got a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of copper here. We're going to have to put at least 5% escalation on this because that's the way things are trending right now. Or you might say steel's really high right now. This job's not going to happen until the winter when steel goes down a little bit we'll bring our price down a little bit. So I kind of answered your question in two different ways. For one, a seasoned estimator and project management team should be trending those costs in, in making some adjustments in the estimate, but also a good business development manager and estimator should be including in their proposal form any verbiage that you have that would talk about the potential for price escalation or uh, material deliverables that might be 
longer than usual. So it sounds to me that second part, it sounds to me like uh, that's basically that communication that you were talking about uh, in your in the first question. Would you say that's true? Yeah, absolutely. And it makes its way through. If I am making a proposal for a large project, uh, I'll ask for a lot of pricing. And when I'm ready to actually write my proposal to the owner or end user, I'll probably go to my top manufacturers that I work with a lot and are able to communicate with me well and say, hey, listen, how long is it going to take me to get this fiber optic cable? How long is it going to take me to get this, uh, you know, tester that I need or these toilets or whatever it is, drywall? And if they're able to give me some sort of verbiage, I will copy it and paste it and put it right into my proposal. You know, that's really it. And that's really, again, touches on what I talked about earlier, where manufacturers, reps and vendors really have to maybe not participate in the risk that contractors have, but at least understand it and, and help us through that. Um, we go through a lot all the time and it's important when you have a team member like that who understands what you're going through, whether it's liquidated damages or it's a compressed schedule or it's a very difficult owner, um, they're, they're in the boat with you, whether they like it or not. So the more they know about the project, the better. So do you think that there is a good estimator knows kind of the ebb and flow? One thing you had mentioned uh, was, you know, steel prices going down in the winter. Does a good estimator know that ebb and flow and understands that? And to that point, does the rep also understand that as well? Does that help? Yes. Yes and yes. Both of them should know that. You know, they, they should. Um, th this economy has been uh, very unpredictable recently, but especially in the Northeast, there is a lot of predictability w with prices and price points and what goes up and what goes down. And I just do happen to know that steel historically takes a little bit of a dip in the mid to late winter in central New York and most of New England because construction slows, the weather's slow. And so uh, there's a little bit more available and it's, it, it, but yeah, absolutely. Every estimator should understand all of the pricing, all the commodities pricing and, and the trends and, and other market forces and how they affect that. So maybe gas goes up and the price of copper goes down. There's a paradoxical relationship between the two. So yeah, it, it, it's, having, it's having that season, it's having that experience in estimating and watching, not just estimating, but watching the results of a, of a project that you estimated and how it came out and the successes and the failures and that what that's what leads you to becoming a better estimator. So it's really learning from each project, not just saying the project's done, I bid it, it's over, but also looking back and saying what are the what are some consistencies, what are some of the inconsistencies, and what have I learned? Sure, yeah, trending your projects um, and just remit whether you do it officially with spreadsheets and data collection or just remembering, uh, just remembering that hey, copper really took a quite a quite a dive or a real hike on that project or uh, geez, the availability of, of those lights wasn't nearly what I thought it was. And we ended up having to pay overtime to install them. And that was a loss. You know, you may remember that um, by, by talking with your management team or getting chewed out by the owner or whatever, whatever official or unofficial capacity it is. Uh, these are all ways of trending your projects and trending the results and trying to make adjustments to make you a better estimator. Uh, great information there. Thank you. That was extremely helpful. So as sure. a con yeah, as a contractor, uh, your reputation is partially tied to the manufacturers that you partner with. You know, as you said before, there's a lot of people that, you know, a lot, a lot of the same people that uh, your industry works with. So, um, so the quality of their products that you're going to be installing, you know, your reputation is kind of built on that. So because of this, what's going to be top of mind for you when you're selecting building products? Uh, top of mind is, is usually, yeah, just an overall reputation and quality, uh, especially in my area of construction in the MEP fields, mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Uh, there's a lot of moving uh, pieces of, and parts. And if they fail, um, it's expensive to replace them uh, from a labor standpoint. And it becomes a difficulty and a heartache for the owner. And it's a little bit embarrassing for the contractor sometimes. Now, there are warranties, almost always implied warranties and written warranties and contracts, but you just don't want to go down that, that road. So 
So selecting a manufacturer that is well known um, and is known for quality is important. And you weigh that against cost, obviously, because the basis of award for a lot of projects is low cost uh, or lowest responsible costs. But for the most part, um, using a reputable manufacturer is, is pretty important. And I have some industrial clients where cost is not really as important nearly as much as uh, highest quality of material and because of maybe a mission critical uh, type situation or uh, just a, a, a really uh, high pressure environment where they can't, failure cannot happen. So, so yeah, absolutely. The reputation of the actual product and the, and the manufacturer are, are very big. So let's say that embarrassment does happen. And uh, do you... It does. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking for not asking for a story here, but uh, what what would happen? Do you usually give a second chance, or is it kind of like I'm done? Uh, and how do you select? I guess that new manufacturer. Well, it's it's not it's almost never a one and done. It all has to do with how um, how the how the the rep and the and the company can how the manufacturer handles the failure and, and the reason for the failure too. There's a lot of decision making that goes into switching manufacturers, but obviously, and this circles back to what's that top level uh, consideration for choosing a manufacturer, and it's that communication in, in working with you. If I have a failure and another manufacturer can, can get right back to me with a replacement and say, we'll worry about the paperwork later, I recognize that you need this as soon as possible, and they work with you, um, and they explain to you why the, why the, the failure happened, and it's a reasonable explanation, then that's a lot different than, uh, than a lack of communication, a lack of response, and a lack of valid response. Well, you know, return it to us. We'll start the paperwork. We can't get you a return till, till this one comes back. I mean, that's, that, it's, that makes all the difference in the world. And, and that also reiterates the fact that manufacturers have to understand what contractors are going through and, and, and the pressures that we get from our owners and end users. So um, yeah, it's, that makes a big difference. And then as far as going to a new manufacturer, um, obviously availability is important, their reputation is important. And um, you do a little bit of research and see and see what they have to offer you. But um, sometimes, sometimes even a great manufacturer who is very reputable, if they have one or two failures, uh, the owner may not want uh, any of their products again, and you have to go to another manufacturer. Or price or availability are, are a little bit more desirable in, in that particular case, so it's time to change. I like how you included uh, that you're not just the only one in this decision, that the owner is the one that can say, listen, I'm never going to deal with them again. And so you're almost required to make that switch. So um, in making that switch, uh, how do you do, you mentioned you do some research. How do you personally do research or what are some of the uh, industry standards, the way people research to find those new manufacturers? Well, to find really new manufacturers that I have no experience with, um, I have to reach out to, I use my vendors a lot. So my vendors are all act as distributors for these manufacturers. There's a, there's, there's a few different tiers of, of distribution here in, uh, in New York for my type of products. Well, um, I could go to anything from LinkedIn to buyer's guides from the, our, our local building builders exchange. I go to other users, other contractors who are friendly. Uh, I talk to other owners, um, co-workers. It's really a little bit of everything. Um, advertising is good, but it's only the beginning. Uh, getting your name in front of uh, an estimator or project manager is great. So you have that notoriety, but it's got to be backed up with something substantive, such as a good reputation, a good price, something that's available. And for the most part, uh, most manufacturers in our area and, and, and most of New England um, they, they use the manufacturer's rep system. So manufacturer's reps represent these lines. And, and you have, you know, manufacturer's reps, agencies that, that rep a bunch of different lines, they really have a responsibility to you to, to make sure that they've, they're giving you a good product. And if it fails, you know, they, they stand to lose all your business across the board on other products as well, too. So a lot of things are tied together there. But as far as finding new stuff, it's there's a little bit of word of mouth. There's a little bit of advertising. I, Obviously, I'm biased towards LinkedIn, and I think it's great. Uh, but trade, you know, buyers guides are are really good too, and trade magazines. 
they're good. They catch my eye. Some people don't like to read them. I like them. I think it's a great way to find new products. So how do you specifically use LinkedIn to conduct uh, building product research? Can you walk me through your process? Well, what I do is I follow a few different hashtags and user groups. So uh, for instance, I'm a big switch gear guy. I like working on the larger, more complex electrical apparatus. So I follow uh, the hashtag switch gear. Okay. And I follow the hashtag transformers and people are constantly posting their own content, uh, whether it's paid manufacturer content or their own individual content on LinkedIn. And so you'll see when, a transformer line adds a particular uh, new line of transformers or an option or a feature to new transformers. So that's right there. Not to mention there are user groups. So if uh, all the specifiers of transformers or the specifiers of switchgear are in a particular group, the manufacturers usually hop in there and add a little bit of a little bit of information. And then obviously there is advertisement on LinkedIn. So if it, LinkedIn knows that you're a particular you have you work in a particular work discipline or you travel in a particular circle of construction people you will see some targeted uh advertising coming right to your face on your feed what's your favorite kind of content that you like to see is it a is it a mixture are you always stopping on a video uh do you prefer the slides do you prefer articles you'd mentioned previously that you really like uh you know looking at some trade magazines are you more of a reader what's the content that really catches your eye almost 90 percent of the time i like business social media like linkedin um i think that it's um it's pertinent they they obviously have a way of of knowing what what you would be you're interested in um, I do like video. I like uh, really short, well put together instructional videos or, or, or educational videos. Here's a new product. Here's how it works. Uh, I don't need the whole backstory of why it was needed and this and that. Obviously, I'm in the trade. Um, short and sweet, to the point. I think those are very good. There's a huge uh, demand for those types of videos still. People contact me and contact some of my other authors asking them to make them for their particular products. I think they're great. Um, you know, photos are fine too. I think that they're good. I think someone whose brain can process a lot of different information at once, if you slide through and you see a photo of a particular cable support system or a fastener, you'll remember it and you'll see it. Uh, those, those are really good. Rick, Magazines are a little bit more casual. I like to read them early in the morning or when I just have a little bit of, I'd call downtime away from the computer. Um, you know, it is the nice big glossy images always do catch someone's eye from a, from a marketing standpoint. I know that works. Um, sucker for it. And, uh, but I really scrolling through a, uh, scrolling through trade emails are decent. You know, you get them from some you like, some you don't, some you have to unsubscribe to. Uh, but the, they're all good. Um, but but the, the social media the, and the short videos, I think, are the best for me. When I see something work, when I see a crimper work, I see a conduit vendor work, I'm, I'm all in. Oh, that's great advice. I, I really appreciate that. That's that's really good. I hope there are manufacturers out there that are listening that these short how-to videos, uh, That's it seems to me that that's, that's kind of the sweet spot there, um, not just for you, but for a lot of people, you know, because the video can tell a story much better than the assumptive, you know, even the nice pictures. You can still assume a certain thing, certain things, or you maybe yeah. have to like pinch to zoom in to see a certain part of the product. Whereas the video just shows it to you, so um, that's sure. that's great advice. I like that. So, what can mm -hmm. uh, one thing you mentioned about you know emails? Some some of them you get, some of them you unsubscribe, and you know how can manufacturers do a better job to foster relationships, uh, especially with installers on LinkedIn in particular? How could a manufacturer um, get to their client, their their existing clients, or new clients? Uh, how can they foster better relationships? Uh, well, the relationship's really not through LinkedIn. I think the relationship is a, is always a personal um, is a, is a personal uh, way of going about things. Uh, you can use LinkedIn by finding potential customers and clients by keeping them up to date on what you know the manufacturer is making or what the agency is selling. Um, but, and I think maybe one of the things to answer that question, maybe indirectly, um, how a manufacturer who would highlight projects 
use when when a particular contractor would use their product they would highlight that contractor their effort their project on their linkedin feed so they're basically saying hey look you know xyz electric used our pipe and wire and here it is installed at this parking garage downtown it looks beautiful and they're kind of indirectly getting a little bit of their own uh their own sales pitch but they're also making the relationship better with that contractor by speaking nicely about them and their project so i don't maybe that answers your question no i think that's good that's uh, I, I really like that answer because it, it uh you're boosting someone else up rather than just saying, we're great, we're great, we're great. Well, we have this person who's great, who's using mm -hmm. our great product. So uh, I think that's a, that's a really good answer to really uh, you know, foster that relationship with that particular contractor. Um, and especially with LinkedIn, since everyone you know, tends to have business, uh, not only relationships, but business conversations on LinkedIn, uh, I think that's important. So uh, I like that answer, that's really good. So um, tell, me, tell me a little bit more about your estimating uh, courses, your construction management courses on that you have on LinkedIn. How'd you get involved? Uh, what, what's the content there? Give us a little you know, backstory here into uh, what you're doing on LinkedIn. I started teaching about oh, almost five years ago on LinkedIn Learning. I was um, introduced to them by an, another author friend of mine. And I started, you know, LinkedIn Learning bought lynda.com years ago. And lynda.com was a platform that really focused on mostly um, software, on-screen software instruction. And so I'm, I'm pretty good at some of the estimating software. So I, I taught a few courses there. The content team at LinkedIn Learning asked me if I thought that there would be uh, an audience for construction management topics uh, to include some of the things that I do daily. And I thought absolutely yes, because in construction management, uh, a lot of people who are in construction management don't necessarily come from uh, a, a two or four year school. They come from either a trade school or, or directly from the field, and they're not really privileged to some of the skills that, um, that are needed in an office. So uh, like blueprint reading or doing submittals or reading specifications. So um, is, is a little bit of a feeler. We, we tried to put some of those courses together and we published them. Uh, I, I authored them and instructed them and LinkedIn produced them and, and um, they were quite a hit. They actually were way more popular than my estimating software courses. And I, I suspect the reason why was from what I just said earlier, there is no real um, college, well, there are some college courses for it, but there's not uh, really a, a a project manager needs to have some construction experience. And so they're going to work in the field and then they're not going to really want to go to college to learn construction management. So, the, you know, LinkedIn learning is very skills based. It's not, you know, big uh, degree based. It, it's all about the, the individual skills that an, an individual may need for a particular job. And um, so, so it worked out great. You know, uh, we're finding with the, with the lack of um, the huge demand for people in skilled trades, and people in project management, you know, doing submittals and reading an electrical drawing or uh, knowing what master format is, is, um, you know, it's difficult, to, uh, it's difficult to understand unless you actually take a course on it or learn from someone else. Now you can learn from someone else if you want in your office, but that takes them out of doing their job. Well, if they stop and train you. So LinkedIn learning really, it, it, it's kind of a, a, a double saver for so you don't have to take someone out of their job to teach someone else and and then an individual can use that course and go back to it whenever they want to so it's just it's just a fantastic tool especially for construction right now I would also think that it would help with consistency if everyone on your team has gone through the same course uh, developed by LinkedIn Learning or gone through your course in LinkedIn Learning, then everyone has the same, you know what their knowledge is, you understand it. Does that help with consistency? I, I, I hope so. I think so. <laughs> I, uh, I actually, coincidentally, I emphasize consistency in all of my courses. Whenever I'm, uh, it's, I taught a, a bunch of uh, estimating courses and I just taught a, a course on using uh, communication cabling. And what I'm getting at is I always say in the beginning of these courses, uh, I talk about um, 
glossaries and definitions and terms, a lot of the words that we use, if a team uses the same words uh, in, in the office and in the field, then there's a lot less problems or, or um, communication errors. So yeah, consistency is huge because there is a, you know, everyone uses, um, everyone uses their, their own terms and definitions and, and, and using them correctly. Some people misuse some terms just accidentally. And by doing so, you could slow up the material ordering process or the specification process or the installing process. So, you know, and we are contractors, so everything is legal. So it's important to really, to really kind of dial into that and have consistent concepts and consistent language and grammar. Hey, I just got a question from somebody that's watching live on LinkedIn. Is there value for building product manufacturers to get involved in creating educational courses for contractors to learn from? What are your thoughts? I'd say definitely. Um, there are so many products, and I keep referring back to my trade and it's in, in, in my discipline, and maybe that's not fair. I think it's probably true for all disciplines, but there are so many technical products um, that either you know, have some some uh, instructional videos or need instructional videos to install or to use them. That having those videos uh, and keeping them and keeping them consistent and available at any given time, it, it's very very uh, useful. Um, there's always a new way of installing a particular grounding system, or there's always a new way of installing a circuit breaker and and recommendations for for doing such. And to have it have it in a video, you know, so many people are able to access their, their mobile phone or a mobile device and to look at that, uh, it's fantastic. Um, as a matter of fact, I've often thought that uh, and recommended that manufacturers put a QR code on a particular piece of uh, equipment and keep the training video right there stored online for that particular piece of equipment, whether it's a, a panel board or a lighting controller or anything else like that. It's not that difficult to print out a QR sticker and then you can link it to a particular YouTube video or a free online hosted video and that could be the instructional video for it. I, I think it's very, very handy. That's great advice, especially with the QR code. That's that's really uh, that's good advice. Well, let me ask you this. There, there's probably going to be some naysayers out there that'll say, well, by the time I do the production and I edit it and I do all these different things to make this video, um, I, it's it's too much time. Do these videos, How what, what do you think is the quality? Obviously, you're going to have high quality when it comes to LinkedIn learning, but what about instructional videos? Um, what, what's your advice there from a production and time value? Well, I think it's you need to balance it versus what the effectiveness and the usefulness of the video is itself. But really, any video that's used more than once or twice, um, if you think about it, if it's used for its intended purpose on two or three occasions separate from each other, then you've already saved time. So why not add a little bit of production value to it? It does not have to be over the top. I mean, I'm in my kitchen on my laptop right now this is not a great video i could have done a lot better but i think we've got enough quality here where people are seeing and hearing you and i and we're getting through to people you don't i i think it's better the the higher quality you have the the better it speaks to your dedication to your product and the better it speaks to the quality of your product i i definitely am an advocate for the higher quality but it, you don't have to go over it. you don't need to spend forty thousand dollars on a on a ten dollar item um, but there's a balance. There's a balance there. You, if you can, if you think about the fact that multiple users, installers, and end users will continuously watch this video, and, and and then the manufacturer might be relieved from having to provide that training over and over and over again, because sometimes it's an obligation of uh, through the terms of their sale. Uh, it might be quite a savings. It might be a time savings for them. So it, it may be worth it. So balance is the key here, but also looking into, you know, what's the value here? If I save time in the long run, what's the long game, I guess, is what you're saying, correct? Sure. Sure, absolutely. I, I've i had uh, fire alarm companies have to provide a training video for almost every fire alarm panel that they install in a big building. Big buildings have large fire alarm systems that notify the occupants if there's an unsafe condition, uh, like a fire. They historically for years and years and years going back to when my dad 
and my grandfather were, were installers, we, the, the fire alarm company had to come in and provide by contract a one to two hour training seminar for that particular panel that they've installed. And then we would record it and turn it over to the owner. And finally, some of the manufacturers said, well, you know what? This panel is a, is, is a, you know, a pretty common panel. We install it in a lot of different systems. Let's do a really high end pr production quality training video with all the different options and even some selectable, you know, bookmarks in it. So a, a user could go back and forth to the different topics within the training video. And we won't, we'll be, we'll be relieved of having to go to a particular job site and, and do this every single time. We'll just distribute it at, as a, when we make the sale. So they've, they're saving, you know, ten, tens of thousands of dollars. I love it. That's a great example, especially with such something that's so important as a, an emergency warning system. So yeah. um, great example there. I really like that. So yes, uh, to the LinkedIn user that uh, that tuned in and uh, asked the question, there is definitely a value for building products manufacturer to get involved in creating educational courses and developing those videos. But of course, there's also the balance that uh, you need to take a look at and the long game as well. So sure. great, great advice, Chris. Thanks so much. Uh, speaking Speaking of advice, I got my last question for you. And what is the best advice that you have ever received? Hmm, the best advice I have ever received. Uh, you know, a long time ago, when I was just starting out in the trade, I worked with a uh, electrician, my friend Randy, and um, I was disconnecting what I thought was a de-energized panel. And um, there was a little spark in it. Uh, no one was hurt. There was no, nothing too dangerous happened. But I, I remember telling him, I says, Randy, you know, I thought that this panel was off. And he said, Chris, whenever you think that you know what's going to happen with electricity and which way it's going to travel and how it's going to react, it ends up doing something a little bit different. So you always need to be ready. You always need to be prepared. And while that wasn't a piece of advice, it really kind of mimics the expect the unexpected moniker that you hear a lot. And that's exactly, um, I think, that type of theory or, 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 or saying is what I believe in. Expect the unexpected. Um, be prepared. And construction is a risk game. It always has been. If you're, if you're good at building, that's great. And, 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 I, and I enjoy building and having a product on, but I, you need to expect the unexpected. Uh, be prepared for labor shortages. Be prepared for new types of materials or a contingency plan if you can't get the materials that you have. Be prepared for anything that might happen and communicate communicate whether it's casually or legally with your with your owner with your end user with your vendors with your suppliers um ask the questions don't just place an order for a truckload of pipe don't just you know commit to a certain amount of construction work to be done within a four month period talk about what you're going to do tell them listen if this isn't going to happen then I, this this and this might need to happen instead it's all about expecting what might not happen or what might. There's knowns and there's unknowns, and, and you have to to kind of know your unknowns a little bit. So, expect the unexpected is is something I live by. That is great advice. Now I have to ask: Do you include that advice in any of your LinkedIn courses? Um, uh, a little bit, okay. a little bit. I I try to be well. I try to be so thorough that there should be no unexpected. Um, uh. but I do. I introduce all of my courses by saying that 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 to what degree the course is either introductory or intermediate, and that there's always more to learn on any particular topic. And I talk to all of my students as if um, they, you know, you should know where we're at. You should under if you're taking this course, you should have. Uh, previous experience in this course, or this is a beginner course. This is for everyone, but it's just a jumping off point for a much larger industry that is mm. constantly growing, constantly evolving, and is really one of the best industries and the, the best professions that anyone can be involved in, in my opinion. This has been such a great episode, you know, between consistency, communication, balance, and expect the unexpected. Uh, Chris, you've offered so much uh, great advice, and I, I really hope that our audience found some value, not only in this live episode, but also as they're listening to the podcast later, or if they're checking us out on social media. And of course, if you'd like to share some of the uh, nuggets of wisdom that we will provide to you, uh, I would appreciate that greatly. 
Well, even we even talked about Italian food too. So I know, got really, a bit of football. It, you know, steak, football, Italian food. You got a little bit of everything in this episode. It's been great having you on the show, Chris. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks, I appreciate it. All right, listen. You have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. See ya. See ya. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've gotten some good value out of this because uh, I just want to thank Chris for joining us today in this episode. Uh, this episode is titled How Building Product Manufacturers Can Support Contractors in Navigating Construction Management. So manufacturers out there, I hope you're listening and you found this episode valuable. Chris had some great insights. So there are a couple of rewind moments or uh, if you don't want to go through and rewind it or listen to the podcast when we publish it later next week, uh, certainly follow us, uh, Manobite on uh, LinkedIn. That's where we like to stay. But you also can, that's where we like to stay and play and uh, have conversations mostly on LinkedIn there. But you can also follow us on Facebook, YouTube, as well as Twitter. So uh, join us there and you can grab all of these nuggets in short little snippets, just like Chris was mentioning, in short short videos. They may not be a how-to, but uh, Chris definitely had some great advice there. So please give us a like, give us a subscribe, uh, you know, follow us on all the socials. But like I said, Manobite likes to hang out mostly on LinkedIn. So like and follow us there. Uh, I just want to thank all of you that joined us today live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, on our favorite platform, LinkedIn Live. This is uh, Building Materials Marketing Unboxed that you've been watching, and we're live every second and fourth Tuesday of the month. So if you want to be notified next time we go live, please follow us on LinkedIn. So for those of you that are watching a replay on YouTube or are listening to the podcast sometime in the future, thank you for watching and thank you for listening. And until next time, whatever life unboxes for you, may it be great.